This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in Good morning. My name is RJ. I'm the youth pastor here, and I want to uh, get you the service started today with a few announcements. Uh, th after this service right here, if you're interested in our Brazil mission trip, uh, the information will be given out in the middle classroom straight behind me here. Uh, again, no obligation if you show up. You can still not go if you don't want to, but it'll be a great opportunity to kind of hear um, all the details and the cost, the plan, all the things like that. So that's happening after second service today, right after this, right back there. Uh, party with the pastor. So many of you maybe attended last time we did this about a year or so ago. Um, but again, we have new faces and we want to make sure that you new faces can make sure you get placed where you're gifted. We, help, we are going to feed you lunch and we're going to share all about the happenings of our church. And so if you really love junior high kids, I will find a spot for you. And, um, and again, if that's not your, your jam, we'll have other opportunities for you. But if you don't mind just signing up, through the QR code or call the church office, any way is most convenient for you, just so we know we have enough uh, ribeye steaks for you for that day. So next thing I want to uh, bring your attention to is our Before the Throne concert. That's happening Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, and uh, it is going to be a night of worship. It's going to start right here at 6 o'clock that Sunday night, and just an intentional time to dive into worship, 10 or so songs, maybe some testimonies. Um, just a great opportunity for us to join together in worship for intentional time on top of a normal Sunday morning. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, but first, also, I wanted to uh, share something new that we are starting today. Um, this is, I, again, I twisted Pastor Gerald's arm to kind of introduce this, but um, I'd love to just get your two cents and maybe some questions that you have about our Revelation series. We've been doing it for since like August. And maybe you have some questions that you thought about as you're sitting out there. Um, so we want to create an opportunity for you to give us those questions. So that, that number that you see on the screen or the QR code will do the same thing. Um, just an opportunity to say, hey, Pastor Earl, I don't really, can you expound more on verse 12? I don't really understand what's, um, what you meant by this or what this meant in the passage. And then with those questions, we're going to put a video together and he's going to kind of answer, go through those questions. So you go back and kind of look into for more information on that. So if you want to join us with that, maybe shoot us some questions. I will say it does ask you for your name. Of course, first question says, hey, what's your full name? Put my name in there, put 
I don't know, Tony Blair is a name from the past. Throw that in there. I, whatever you want to put does not matter. The point is, I want to get your questions. And so we can kind of go through those and answer those um, this coming week. So uh, with that, I know you've been listening to me for a bit. So would you mind standing up for us? And I'll uh, pray for us as we enter into worship. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to gather together as a church family. It's always amazing each Sunday morning that we get to see um, all the many faces of all ages come and join us. And I pray for um, this time of worship as we enter into it now, that our hearts would be ready to receive um, what you have for us, that we'd focus on the words um, and the, the reason why we're here in the first place. And pray a prayer blessing over the sermon as well, Father, that you would um, just ready our hearts to receive what we have in the book of Revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have sound? You can hear me sing solo. Anybody want to sing? Yeah. We, don't, we don't have drums. Just go. Okay. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met you I was breathing the night You 
think we did him justice. So let's hear it and then sing us in the next one.
Good morning. Wow, you can feel God's presence in here this morning. Amen? How many saw the rainbow the other night? We were sitting in, in Dose, and we came out, and there was all these people standing out there taking pictures and looking at this. It was a true testament that God's faith had truly shown up that night. And so, knowing me, you know, Missy, she wants to take pictures and all this stuff, and I'm looking down to the south, and I'm seeing the end of that rainbow, and I said, you know what? That thing's in Cropsey. We need to get going. That pot of gold might be at our house. <laughs> so every morning before I take off to come into school, I, I go through a, a devotion, and I came across one this week that I just want to share with you. It's about giving generously, and it fits very well with the time of the season that we're in. We're in planting season. And it comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 6. It says this, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Then it goes on in the explanation and it says, You should not give in order to grow richer, but your resources will grow when you give more. What you receive in return may be a spiritual or relational rather than material. One of the great parts of the Christian life is that the more generously you give, the more God blesses you in some way. One of the reasons for, th for this is that the same qualities that make you responsible and trustworthy also make you generous. But the primary reason is that God and his grace entrust more to you so that you can be a greater channel for bringing his blessings into this world. And then there's a question at the bottom for you to ponder during the, during the day, and it says this, and something for you to think about. How generous are you with your resources that God has given you? Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we are just so thankful for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we're thankful for all of our blessings. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless us so that we can be generous and cheerful givers. Lord, we ask that you bless this offering this morning and that the love that was given in that offering will further your kingdom. Lord, we're mostly thankful for Jesus and the resurrection. Lord, we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I would like to call the kids, if you guys can, can come here. Let me move this for a moment. Today, we're going to share the story of Jacob and Esau. Isaac and Rebecca have two, two boys, two kids, twi twins, right? And uh, Esau was the, the, the muscles, the hair one. He was good to hunting with arrows and all these things, and was the favorite one of his father because he was doing all these brave things. And one day he was hunting and he gets starving, so hungry. And his brother, um, Jacob, he made like a lentil stew. And they trade uh, his uh, bird uh, right. What is, if you be, uh, get bird first, you get a blessing from your pa for, your, for your father. Uh, then he realized his father was getting old and getting the moment to, to give that blessing to the, 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 first, the first son, right? And he was blind. Isaac get blind and he cannot see. So because um, Jacob was the second, the second son, he will not receive anything. And the first one, Esau, he was receiving everything, right? And the mother loved and liked more. Jacob, so she told him, you're going to make like a stew, and we're going to trick your father because he's blind, and you're going to receive the blessing. And he wears some, um, some sheep or, or lamb uh, skins on his shoulders and his arms, and he tricked his father. When, when Esau showed up with the hunt and asked his father to receive the blessing, What's happened? 
Jacob already did. And he gets so mad, so mad about that. I say, I will kill him. But here's the thing. Why Esau trade or sell his birthright with his brother? He don't, he don't give that the importance to his, to his blessing. And sometimes we do the same. Because we come and show up at church, we don't give the importance to this moment, what we have here. You guys, when you go to the children's school or the, the Sunday school, that is really important. And you have to put attention, be obedient to your parents, your teachers, and all the, the people who try to teach and share some Bible's truths trust with you. Okay? What we learned today, Esau, he don't care about what God had for him. But Jacob was the one who put attention. And he was obedient, respecting to what God had for him and his life. You guys want amazing things from God. Do you like that? You, you want amazing things from, from God? Yes. So follow him. Follow him with faith. And he will provide for your life, amazing things. Okay? That is the end. <laughs> okay, let's go back and get ready to go to our class. Okay? Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. And sometimes I feel like I. So come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong.
Good to see you all. How are you all doing this morning? We good? Pretty good? That wasn't very convincing, but I'll take you at your word. Well, we're going to continue our, our study in the book of Revelation. Um, but before we get there, I just want to kind of um, try to set our mind on the reality of what we've been talking about in the tribulation period. So today, currently in our world, I guess we somewhere in the last year or two passed the um, 8 billion people on the planet Earth. Now, that's a hard number to process, at least it is for me. So I looked at some comparisons, and one of them I found, it said if you started taking steps um, and you started counting them, you would circle the earth 139 times before you got to 8 billion steps. Or let's say that your job was to punch in and count numbers all day for eight hours. It would take you 761 years of doing your job of counting to count to 8 billion. That's staggering. That's just amazing. The reason I want us to think about that is because we believe that there's an event coming in the future called the tribulation, and it's going to be a seven-year period. And if you've been with us, when we got to seal judgment number four in the first half, it said that a, a quarter of the, the world would be killed, a quarter of mankind. So again, if, if the Lord returns when there's somewhere in the ballpark of 8 billion people, like today, that would mean a staggering 2 billion people would die in a short period of time, maybe over a year or two. Comparison, think about World War II. Even if you're not a history buff, we know a little bit about World War II um, with Stalin and Hitler and Mussolini and all the evil that was enacted on the planet at that time. And there was 100 million people that died approximately during World War II. But here we're talking about 2 billion people perishing in a short period of time. Um, so that would bring our total from 8 billion down to 6 billion. Now, if you were here, here last week, Pastor Brian talked about this 200 million man army. And in that passage in Revelation chapter 9, which is in the second part of the tribulation, um, that another third of those remaining would die. So a third of, of what's remaining would be another two billion that would die. So the long and short of it, in this tribulation period, if you believe God's word, if you believe it to be taken literally, there'd be a, approximately four billion people that would die in a seven-year time period. That's hard to process. 
Like think about Fairbury, we're give or take, I guess, a little bit. I don't know exactly, but say 4,000 people. That means statistically, if we are like the norm during the tribulation period, we'd go from 4,000 people to 2,000 people. You might think, oh, that might be way off in another lifetime. Maybe not. Maybe not. The point I'm trying to make is that this time period we're talking about is a time when the physical and the spiritual world collide in a way we never saw before, and half the population will die in a short period of time. And I, it reminds me of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24 when he said, if those days had not been shortened, no human being would survive to the end. So he's saying troubling times, chaotic times, horrific times, or even in the future. So if we take Jesus at his word, and we should, um, that he's telling us this will be unique in any other, um, way different than any other time period, way different than any other war we've ever seen. And it's hard to think through that. I've studied Revelation a few times, but it's, it's hard to wrap your brain around that. I, I shared in the first service, usually at the end of the year, Duffy Pills um, does a service. Um, they call it a, like a, a blue worship service. And it's kind of to invite anybody that lost a loved one throughout the last year to come and have a little worship service at, um, at Duffy's and our, as, as ministers were there. And the last thing they do is they read off every name. And we've done it a number of years. We didn't do it this past year. But usually they'll, they'll read off a, that they've done about 125, maybe 150, 160 funerals that year. But during this time period, again, it could be different statistically, but on average, half the population will die. And that's amazing to think about. And so that goes to worldview. Now, there's some of you that are just like your elbow and the person next to you, that, you know, the pastor's crazy up there. What do you do with this book? Do you believe it? Do you believe it's God's word? Um, if you do, God's word talks about a, a horrific time of judgment on sin and because people rejected Jesus Christ. So I want to take us through the big picture of things for a moment. God created the world. He created it perfect in every way. And there was Adam and Eve and there was no sin. And then, of course, Satan fell. And then, of course, Adam and Eve fell. And since then, we are all sinners. And really, we have no hope. Um, we have no hope in and of ourselves. There's nothing we can do about that. But we, you know the story, hopefully, that God the Father sent Jesus, his son, into this sin-cursed earth to live here, to be born. He lived differently than any other man or woman ever in that he was perfect in every way. And so when he willingly offered himself on the cross, he shed his blood for ours so that all who believe in him will not perish and have everlasting life. That's how God rectified the problem. But we are still sinners, and, and the only way we can have hope is by believing in Jesus Christ. So think about this. Ever since Jesus was here for 2,000 years, give or take a little, um, everyone has died. Every generation has died. And you're, you're saying, you're not giving me a whole lot of new information here, Pastor. There's nobody that's 1,900 years old or 1,200 years old or even 200 years old, right? Everyone has died and we will die too unless the Lord returns. So what do you do with that? Well, as Christians, you believe that if you believe in God's word, you believe that immediately to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's something about a Christian immediately going into the presence of the Lord when we die, and there will be a resurrection someday of the earthly bodies. But he will, regardless of what you believe about end times and how it'll work out, hopefully we all believe in something called the second coming. The first coming was Christmas, when Jesus came as a baby. That was his first coming. You might say, well, pastor, what about the rapture? Isn't that his second coming? No, that's where he will catch his church up to meet him in the air. He won't literally be on the earth. His feet won't touch there until the second coming. Hopefully we all believe in a second coming. And if we believe that, then there's these passages in Revelation that talk about these tumultuous times called a tribulation period. And that's where we are in the book of Revelation. We're really in, even if you're not a believer yet in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're in a fascinating part of Scripture. 
So on the sixth trumpet judgment, remember there's three sets of judgments. I know you can't see this, but there's seven seal judgments that lead into seven trumpet judgments that lead into six or seven bowl judgments. And we've been through, we're, we're kind of towards the end here. And at the sixth trumpet judgment in verse 13, um, there's one trumpet blow left to lead. And the seventh trumpet judgment is the unveiling of the, the bowl judgments. And so we're, we're kind of towards the end. But the next, the next judgment won't come for five chapters till Revelation 15. We're in Revelation 9 now. So what, what happens between Pastor Brian, where he left us off last week, and five more chapters? What's going on here? Well, that's our text this morning. So if you have a Bible, um, Revelation chapter 10, I'm going to read the entire chapter. We did get a handful more of these in here. If you haven't got one of these yet, um, please see one of us, and we'd, we'd love to get you one. Um, not right now, but after the service, maybe. Um, but if you're physically able, would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? I'm going to read the whole chapter. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, his legs like the pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. When the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that, that there would be no more delay. But in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God, of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will, in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. I, it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it in my stomach, it made me bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. Well, John is given another vision from heaven, and the vision in some senses is pretty simple. It's pretty quick. Um, you probably tracked along with it. It starts by talking about a mighty angel. We're going to spend some time talking about this angel, and then it talks about a little scroll, and then finally it tells John to prophesy again, or again prophesy. So we're going to talk about that as well. But the devastation, the horrific judgments that we've been plowing through are, are kind of paused for a moment. And, and we are on kind of the, the precipice of the culmination of everything. When the second coming of God is finally going to happen, we're right there, and then our passage comes. So who is this mighty angel? It says, a mighty angel coming down from heaven. Now, we got a little picture we, we have up here. And honestly, usually I don't like pictures like this, but this one is very um, biblically accurate, and that's why we're going to use it this morning. But the, the thing I always like to know, if you've heard me talk before, like when I watch a movie, um, my son and, and, and my wife are into like Star Wars and Marvel movies and stuff, and, and Dad's not very smart, so I always got to ask him, who's the good guys and who's the bad guys? Like, I'm never quite sure because they always are doing things. And I love the westerns of days gone by where the bad guys wore what color hats? They wore black hats, right? And the good guys wore white hats. Why do we have to ever change that? We could have stayed with that forever. But I always want to know who the good guy and who the bad guy is. So what about this angel, this mighty angel? Is he a good guy or is he a bad guy? Well, you know, if you've been with us in Revelation, when we were in Revelation chapter 6 and the four apocalyptic horses were released, and do you remember the first one? It was a white horse. And white is usually good, right? But if you remember back, the rider of the white horse, it was a symbol of the Antichrist. 
The, the real white horse and the rider will be Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. So it was a counterfeit horse that was leading off. So sometimes in Revelation, we have to use some discernment. But who is this mighty angel? Good guy or bad guy? Is it Michael the archangel? Is it Gabriel? Is it one of the angels we know? Well, we don't know who this angel is, but we do know this. It's pretty easy to figure out. It's, it's a good angel. It's not a demonic angel. The demonic angels, they, they, they ascend from the abyss. Remember we talked about the abyss, the pit, um, that, that God keeps them stored down there. This angel is a servant of God and descends from heaven. So we know the angel is good, but do we know more? Well, some people think it's Gabriel because the word Gabriel literally means mighty one or mighty angel, um, but we can't know for sure. And there's, there was an angel back in chapter 5, verse 2, and we'll see another mighty angel in chapter 18, verse 21. So we're not sure who it is, but the description of this angel, and again, I love this picture because every part of it is coming right out of Scripture. It starts out with talking about wrapped in a cloud. A cloud is often associated with the glory, the majesty of God. Um, and we know that from the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament next week in chapter 11, there's going to be a description of heaven and talking, talk about wrapped in a cloud. And when we get to Revelation 14, it's going to talk about something like a son of man. That's a reference to Jesus in the Old Testament and how he will be kind of wrapped in a cloud as well. But I, I bet most of us know an Old Testament story. Think of flannel graph and the, the pillar of the cloud that followed along, and it traveled in front and behind of God's army in the book of Exodus. But the, the presence of the cloud was, was associated with glory, with majesty, with God's power. Or think of Solomon when he's in the temple. The place was filled when he was installing the Ark of the Covenant. The place was filled with a cloud representing again the glory of God. So, so this angel is first described wrapped um, in a cloud. Secondly, the rainbow over his head. The rainbow again has much symbolism. It's a description of God's faithfulness. And our minds immediately go back to Noah and the flood. After the flood... There's God, God gives the rainbow, kind of like the rainbow Kyle talked about. And the rainbow is a promise that God will never destroy the earth in that way again. And it's, so it's a, the rainbow is a reminder of faithfulness and even God's mercy in this mighty angel. And then the next one, it says that his face um, kind of sh uh, shined like the sun. And this is where some people thought, or, or jump to the conclusion that this is a picture of Jesus. I think they're wrong in this, in this instance. But there's a few times that Jesus is described as his face shining like the sun. Revelation 1, verse 6, the description of Jesus, it said it had a, he has a face shining like the sun. Or think about the transfiguration when Jesus and three disciples went up on the mountain and he transfigured in front of them. It says in Matthew 17 that Jesus' face, it shone like the sun. But the face of this angel is, is brilliant. It's, it's radiant because, again, this angel came from God and it's, it's reflecting the, the presence of God even as it descends here. And then look at the legs. The legs are, are kind of like on fire is the first part. They're, they're pillars of fire. And notice one leg is on land and one leg is on the sea. And that, again, is an intentional description right out of our text here. Um, the, the description of the legs show that they're firm. They're stable. They're immovable. There's an unbending holiness in this angel. And one foot on the land and one foot on the sea is going to come to life more when we get in Revelation 13 because there will be beasts that come out of both the land and the sea. And so God is talking in this angel. He's demonstrating his sovereignty as an angel that has sovereign. He's sovereign over the sea and he is sovereign over the land. God's representative in this angel is showing authority over both. In the Bible, when you put your foot on something in the Old Testament, it means you have authority over it. That's the reference. That's the image to these, these feet over both. And then it says in verse 2 that this angel had a little scroll opened in his hand. 
The little scroll is mentioned four times in the passage, so it's clearly emphasized. We're going to talk about it a little bit more in a moment. But there's information on this scroll that we're going to talk about. And then finally, there's in verse 3, it said, He called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. So this angel has a, a voice. He is not timid. He is not... Um, deferring to anyone. He has confidence. He stands there at the call, the beckon, even the presence of God. And he has this, displays this, this great authority of God himself. So when we get to the end of this magnificent description of this angel, and I didn't even talk about on the, there's seven lightning bolts kind of on the side, and it d- depicts that in the text as well. When we get to the end of this description, you, you almost picture John getting his ink blotter out, and he's ready to describe everything that he saw and everything that he heard through these voices, and John is told, stop. Don't write any of this down. And we wonder what's going on there. Like, why is not he to write any of this down? Well, simply put, we aren't being told everything that's going to happen here. We are told some some very key things. First of all, who's in charge of all of Revelation? We're told that, and it's God. We're we're told about the flow of the events. Hopefully, if, if anything we've seen in Revelation, sometimes people think it's a difficult book, a confusing book, but the structure of it is very straightforward. It's very easy to decipher where we're talking about, even with the things that we have kind of broken down in a chart. So, so there's a flow of events, and we very clearly see in the book of Revelation that God will defeat his enemies once and for all. But there is a lot that we simply don't know. So when this voice comes boldly from heaven, verse 4, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. It's like, John, okay, put your pen down. We're not writing this down. So this majestic angel says there's not going to be any more delays, but then it seems like there's kind of a delay. Because the culmination, we are right here at the end. We have one more judgment, trumpet judgment to come out, which is the bowl judgments. And then we are finally to the second coming. We are there, and he's told not to write. Then we get to verse 8. Then I heard a voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, go and take the scroll. And again, I have no idea how big this angel is or how little John is in comparison, but you get the impression that this is a mighty angel. And this is little John, and he's told to go to the angel and take the scroll. Like, please, Mr. Angel, can I, can I borrow that scroll for a few minutes? And then the mighty angel says, take it and eat it. And he talks about in your stomach it's going to be bitter, but in your mouth it's going to be sweet as honey. And then the very last verse of the passage, verse 11, it's, he, it, uh, John is told, you must again prophesy. You must again prophesy. So again, the the time is almost up. We are finally at the culmination of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's right here, and John seemingly is told about it, and then it's like, John, put your pen down. you got to prophesy again. So what does that mean? Well, it means John's going to go back, and he's going to start to give us more detailed information. We're going to have a chart up coming so, so John has written about almost the entire revelation, and he is told to prophesy again. And I'm going to make the argument that the things he's going to talk about and give us information about is going to be primarily in those last three and a half years of the tribulation period. But we're right on the cusp. Again, Revelation 6 and 7 took us through the first half of this, of this tribulation period. And in the first half, things are, are somewhat good. There's the Antichrist is on the scene, but he's not the world ruler yet. Israel is protected, and things are relatively normal, with the exception of a lot of people dying and things falling from the sky, as normal as that could be. But it really goes off the rails when we get to the second half, and that's the part he's going to write on again. So when he's told to go back and prophesy again, He's going to prophesy on the things from the midpoint of the tribulation until the end. Jesus calls that section of the tribulation the great tribulation. Not that it's great in a good way, but that it's intense, it's horrific. 
And the Old Testament prophets, Daniel primarily, chapter 7 and 9, describe that last half in detail as well. But you might say, well, how do we know it's just the last half and not the whole tribulation? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you, you chimed in and asked. You didn't actually ask, but, I, but I, if you'll play along with me for a moment. Let me kind of build the case for why. First of all, remember, John is told to eat the scroll. So what is the scroll? It's more information. It's more information that John is going to prophesy again about. And the next four chapters that we have here in Revelation are some of the most uh, kind of interesting topics. These are ones you're going to not want to miss. Hopefully you won't want to miss any of them. But the ones the next few weeks are going to be really um, kind of showstoppers. Next week, Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses, which is a fascinating part of the story. And then Revelation 12, we're going to talk about the persecution of Israel. Remember the first half, Israel's protected. Israel's feeling pretty good about themselves. They're protected. And even as I say that, there was trouble again overnight. And there is much, tumult, you know, much warfare happening in our world. There is, there is much... Um, persecution happened. There is, there is seemingly events that, that could lead to something much more. We, we don't know the time, but we know the time could be close. So we're going to talk about Israel in chapter 12. Chapter 13 is really the capstone chapter speaking about the Antichrist. And again, that's, we're going to take some information from Daniel 7 and from Revelation 13, but that'll be a, a week that we talk about that. And then Revelation 14, you probably heard about the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon refers to a, a climactic battle future between God and the forces of evil. And thankfully, we know the outcome of that battle. And then after those four chapters... If that's kind of the part of the again, then we will finally be to the unleashing of the final bold judgments in chapter 15 and 16. But that's not the only reason that I say that, that we know it's the second half. There's also, when we get the next four chapters, John is going to use phrases um, and little words that he is very conscientious about time. And I want to go through a few of these. And this will be a, a little teachy, but if, if you let me um, give me a little leeway here, I think it'll make sense. So again, how do we know that John is going to talk about the second half? Chapter 11, verse 2, don't worry about all the things happening. Just look for the time stamps on each of these. We'll, we'll get to them next week. Do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So trampling the holy city, the holy city is Israel, uh, for 42 months. What is 42 months? It's three and a half years. That will be the second part of the tribulation. The next verse, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now what's 1260 days? That's also three and a half years. It's just another way to say it. And just, just um, for my own curiosity, um, it hasn't been a, a book that's been popular for, for a while, but just curious, how many of you have read um, some or part of the, the Left Behind series? Just, would you raise your hand just so I get a... Okay. It's, um, me and my son are reading through it right now. He wanted to read it, and I've been reading along. It's, it's worthwhile. Now, keep in mind, it's not a theology book. Um, you don't want to build your, your theology off this book and in fact, I think there's, this is one part where, the, where the, um, the book gets it wrong. It puts the two witnesses in the first half of the tribulation. I think, I think they're misguided there. Uh, they didn't ask my opinion, but I gave it anyways. Um, but it, it helps put some, some meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, but that's the second one in chapter 11. In chapter 12, there are two kind of timestamp notifications. It says the woman, verse 6, the woman is Israel, um, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Again, this is speaking about Israel, and I went over this already. The first 1260 days, the first three and a half years, Israel will be protected. At the end, Israel will be persecuted. It will be hell on earth, not only for them, but those around the world. They're protected the first half. They are persecuted by the Antichrist the second half. Verse 14, the woman, again Israel, was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness 
to the place where she is to be nourished for a, this is a new phrase we haven't talked about yet, but we will, time and times and half a time. If you've ever studied the book of Daniel, that phrase comes right out of Daniel. It means three and a half times or, again, three and a half years. So it's, it's different ways of saying the same thing, and, and, and John is clearly showing us where this falls. Um, we're almost done. Verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 5. And here we're talking about the Antichrist. The beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Again, 42 months, three and a half years. So if we put all of this together... The prophetic words in Daniel that are written way before Jesus. So there's Daniel written hundreds of years before Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes on the scene. He talks about this time in in Matthew chapter 24. And then John writes about it in the book of Revelation. So it's still future. But the world ruler, the, the one that we refer to as Antichrist, he will be seemingly good in the first part of this. But when the abomination of desolation happens, we haven't talked about that yet, but we will, it will be hell on earth for the last part of the tribulation. When he will go from being whatever he is in the beginning to a supreme world dictator, world ruler. And we will see that. All of this to say, back to our chapter. So again, it talked about this mighty angel and appears to John and it's going to give him all this great stuff and then it says, stop, don't write it. But there's this little scroll and he's to eat it. And when he eats it, he's told to prophesy again. The things I talked about for those four chapters is going to be our kind of our passages for the next four Sundays at least. Um, so how do we bring this home? This, this week is more... Uh, I like to teach, but this week's a little more teachy than I want us to get some application. Here's the application. First thought as we close is this. He's told to eat the scroll. What's that mean? It's, it's to eat it. It's symbolized like absorbing what is assimilating what God is saying, assimilating God's word. And when John eats it, he will find it both bitter and sweet. And you know the same thing when we read parts of God's word. God's word is sweet when we think about the end times because as Christians, we want God to right all the wrongs in the world, right? We we, we want God to take the earth back because it's rightfully his and to, to bring in his kingdom. But it's also bitter in the fact of this. Every one of us in this room have people that don't know Jesus in our lives. Um, I hope you know Jesus in your life. I hope he is your Savior and Lord. That if something were to happen to you today, you would be in the presence of the Lord. But even if you are a Christian, you have family, you have friends, you have a neighbor, you have a classmate, you have um, somebody, many people. We have many people in our lives that don't believe in God. And, And eating the scroll is... It's sweet in the sense that God will right all the wrongs, but it's also bitter that there are many people that don't know Christ. If they were to die right now, they would be apart from him forever. And that takes us to our second thought. John is told to prophesy again. I'm calling point number two, never stop. He's to write about these principles again, to never stop. And you know me and you, we are to never stop as well. If you're a Christian, if you understand and believe God's word, and you believe there's a place called hell, you will deepen your compassion for your neighbor, for your friend, for your uh, family, family member, for a classmate, for somebody in your life. You will have compassion on them. And, and you won't try to argue them in, but you will pray for them. You will look for opportunities. And hopefully you will be ready to tell them about Christ. And maybe the way to tell about Christ, you're like, well, pastor, I can't point out verse. And the best way to talk about Christ is the experience that you've received. If if at some point in your life, you realize I'm a sinner, I I deserve to go to hell, but I believe in Jesus Christ, and I know I'm going to be one of God's children, you can talk about how that happened. That you heard a sermon, you heard a song, you talked to somebody, you realized you were a sinner, God convicted you, you were headed the wrong way, and you turned and sought his forgiveness. And you sought, um, re- you, you were repented to him and, and asked for him to, to, to bring you into the fold. Share your story. We all have a great story to tell. Never stop. 
Never stop sharing. Never stop caring. Never stop praying. And third and finally, we can rejoice. We can rejoice because God cares about, verse 11, the many people, nations, languages, and kings. In other words, God loves the world that he sent Jesus, and he loves you too. Do you know him? Do you believe in him? If you do, you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we're so thankful for your word. And God, it's, it's hard to hear and hard to even think about the, that at the end times that many people will die in a short period of time because they're rejecting you and, and there, there will even be Christians that will be caught up in that devastation. But God, I just pray for each of us here. I pray that if there are any that don't know you as Savior, they, maybe their hearts were, were stirred today. I pray they will talk to you. They will go home and read Read more on their own. They will talk to somebody before they leave. God, this life is too short where none of us are promised tomorrow. And we're not trying to, to be sensational in saying that or fatalistic. But God, everybody needs Christ. And there's, there's nothing better than Jesus. He's the only thing that makes the problems of this world not make them disappear, but he's, he promises never to leave us, never to forsake us. And God, the world needs to know that. The world needs to hear it. And may it happen through each of us. May our little church here in Fairbury just be a, a beacon of light, not because there's anything good in us, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God, the world needs Jesus. If there's any that need him this morning, I pray that they won't leave before they find out more, that they talk to someone. And God, if for those that would say, I'm, I believe in Jesus, I, I love him. I know where I'm going when I die. I just pray for our compassion to increase. And when our compassion increases, we will serve you better. We will love you more. We will love our neighbor even as Jesus loved, loved the neighbor when he was here. God, don't leave us go out of this place the same way we came in. May our hearts be changed because of you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please stand with us. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke the name into Great a
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me sing that again We do not serve a God that's dead. He is alive. He is our living hope. I hope you know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Great to have you here this morning. We love you here at First Baptist Church. We'll see you soon. Today